everybody. Welcome. I'm Emily the Fine Art Medium. I am a psychic medium who specializes in the paranormal. I am an astral traveler, an artist, and I'm one of the hosts of the Lights of Midnight podcast. So if you notice my background, yeah, it's different because I'm in a hotel in Bangor, Maine. Um, my boyfriend got invited to help with the set of a movie that is being shot here. And yeah, and I decided to come along. Well, they invited me. I could come along. <laughs> but, you know, later this week, I will be on set as well, helping out just like, you know, maybe with the catering and keeping some of the actors and actresses busy while they sit around and wait for their time to, you know, shine, I guess. But today's video, we are going to be talking about the Thomas Hill House here that is in Bangor, Maine. I actually went there and did a walkthrough, and it is a museum, but it was a house that had been built in the 1830s, right? So, you know, there's some ghosties, and there were some paranormal um, investigations that had been going on, not when I was there, but, you know, investigators like to go there because it is somewhat active. And so as I go through this video, I'm going to talk about my experience as I walked through that house. I'm gonna show my B-roll or the footage I got while I was there, and then I'll go over like the history of that house. And if I'm looking up and down, it's because I'm looking at my notes, because I wrote everything down, because I know I'll forget, right? I'm a human, I fuck shit up. Anyway, so I'm gonna start with the beginning. So as I walked in, I immediately was hit with a female presence. Um, she had like brown hair in an updo, um, but she had like curly pieces in front of her face, or not in front, but on the sides of each side, you know what I mean. But um, yeah, so she looked like she was maybe in her 30s, but um, as I walked through the house, I was able to see more and more of her and she had like a period dress as in like of the 1800s very fancy right but yeah I could see her walking around the parlor room um, it looked like she was preparing for guests I was later told by the tour guide that it was Matilda so we'll go through the families that lived there then later but as I did my walkthrough alone, I noticed the two mirrors facing each other on opposite walls symmetrically. Now, when the house was first built, there was a wall, I believe, in the middle. So, those mirrors weren't always facing each other, which explains why, you know, typically when you have mirrors facing each other, it can create a portal or a vortex and shit happens paranormally. Is that even a word? I don't even know. If, you know, stuff like that is going on. But I think because it wasn't originally like that and there was a wall there, that's why it's not as crazy there. But yeah, usually I would be cautious with things like that and pay extra attention to see if there was anything around. But I would say, or I am going to say, that I didn't feel anything negative. I didn't feel anything malevolent, which is great, <laughs> because a lot of places I go, there's a lot of negative shit, like, hanging around, and then I get attacked, and it's not fun. But, um, yeah. So, I was kind of happy. And I would also like to note that, you know, we were only there for, like, maybe an hour and a half. I don't even know if it was an hour and a half. It might have been a little less than that. The tour was kind of quick though because it was only, you can only go through the one level. You couldn't go upstairs. There wasn't upstairs. But um, yeah. But the part of the, t the thing too was my poor planning. Um, I had emailed the tour guide the night before and was like, hey, like, do you have any openings? Um, and just explain what I wanted to do and he did it. He responded really quickly back, but 
I, well, okay, I'm blaming my medication for this, but I slept in way too late, so I missed his first message, but essentially we were able to get in there, and he was nice about it, but, okay, energetically, it felt lighter than most buildings this age that I've been inside of. I even didn't develop a headache, so that is rare. When I go out in public, bam, headache, always, no matter what, right? Now, I will say this, um, where we are, it is not like where I live, okay? Um, It is definitely not as dense, which would make sense as to why it feels lighter in general here. So, just like leaving the house where I live, instant headache. But here, it's actually nice and peaceful and you don't hear sirens. This probably will be one of my first videos where you don't hear sirens in the background. Jinx knock on wood. (laughs) But, um, yeah, so I didn't get my headache that I typically get. And when I go into, you know, places, because I'm clairsentient, I'm extremely sensitive to energies, right? So when there's heavy, stagnant, dark, or any kind of form of negative energy, it affects my body immediately. So the first thing that'll happen is I'll get a headache. Second, or around the same time as a headache, my stomach will hurt. Or something will hurt, I'll feel it in my body. Or I'll feel really, really tired. But I didn't feel any of that at all. So if we compare it to the Brenton Lodge, let's say, when, you know, I went there, again, it was in a similar area where it wasn't crazy like where I live, right? It wasn't as dense in population. It was kind of similar with how things are spaced out here. But inside that house was thick, heavy, all sorts of things, and my body felt it immediately, and I felt like shit. Here, in this Thomas Hill house, not at all. It was actually pretty peaceful. So the energy I felt from the spirits wandering around was very drifty and weightless. Like, you could tell something was roaming around as if, like, you know, there was an alive person walking around in the room next to you. You know that feeling, right? It's kind of like you know someone's there even if you're not looking. And I'm clear audience too, so I can hear... I don't even know how to describe it. I don't know if it's like air particles and like the dissonance between that energy and the air particles. And I can hear things moving around or just walking. Even if like there's no feet, actual feet touching the ground and making footstep sounds, I can still hear it in the air. I don't know. It's here. It's hard to describe. But um, they were very light and roamy, and a lot of it felt like um, energetic impressions or things that have happened, and it's kind of just like an imprint, right? But um, Matilda seemed pretty friendly and just went on with her business. It kind of felt like she had a routine of things to do, and she just kind of like stuck to those. Oh, and before the tour guide went over the history of this place, I remember seeing an energetic imprint of the activities that took place in this house from having company with other businessmen, um, dinner parties, children playing, and Matilda scrambling around to make sure the house was in adequate condition for the guests. And that's what I saw mostly was her scrambling around, just putting things, you know, where they need to be. So that's mostly of what I saw. And later when we were leaving, I told him what I saw, and he was like, yeah, she's she comes in very strongly, and that is who they usually pick up when they do the investigation. So I was like, damn, because I didn't know any of this, right? A bit later, I saw the faces of two men in the lights of the chandelier hanging in the entranceway. So you'll see it in the video of the entranceway, the chandelier. Um... The feeling of the one felt like it was Samuel Dale, but I couldn't identify who the second one was. The impression was made while I was analyzing the footage. So I was going back and analyzing the footage, seeing if I needed to cut anything out. I wanted to see like what the audio sounded like too. I don't know if I'll keep the audio in because 90% of the time in the audio, I'm not really saying anything. I'm just docking things in my head because, you know, my boyfriend was talking to the tour guide. He was having his conversation, talking about the guns and stuff. You know, 
cool stuff like that. And I just went on my way and just did what I wanted to do and did the walkthrough. Um, yeah. So the impression of the lights and seeing the men's faces was when I was watching the video that I had taken. So this is when I was out of the house. But um, additionally, I did pick up on a black cat in the dining room area in front of the doorway to the left of the fireplace, but I cannot prove that it wasn't through my subconscious because the tour guide mentioned the cat before I picked it up myself. So, you know, I can't prove that it even, I can't even prove to myself whether or not it was something that I picked up psychically or if it was like an imprint in my brain because he said it. So, eh. Overall, I would say this was a great educational experience in terms of history, but also in mediumship practice. I try to get as much mediumship practice as I possibly can because, you know, I need to practice. Always. Right? It's kind of like a muscle. It's like if you don't practice it, you could lose it. In some cases, depending on how people's abilities work, they'll never lose it. But for me... I don't know, I feel like I have to constantly practice, but more so for validation of myself that I am getting what I'm getting and I'm not like crazy too. A lot of it is validation. But um, I highly recommend visiting the Thomas Hill House in Bangor, Maine if you are ever in the area. The tour guide was extremely nice and knowledgeable and I want to thank him for his kindness and for letting us, you know, come in with short notice. Lastly, I would like to add that the Bangor Historical Society does have a donation link on their website, and I'll link that down below that you guys can donate to, and they provide free tours, and so I'm definitely donating, you know, after this video. I forgot, but because the tour was free, I kind of felt bad because he did a really good job, and yeah, I want to at least pay him for his job well done. Um, but yeah, the donations go to programming, events, and the care and preservation of their collection, as well as the Thomas A. Hill House. So, um, they have, of course, antiques, some original stuff from the house, but not a lot. But they also have things from the area, from um, the Civil War, they have a cannon from the Civil War, friggin' Paul Revere's cannon. Um, they have shotguns and guns that they used in the war. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there and it's really cool. My favorite was the apothecary chest that you guys will see later in the video, but I thought that was really cool and how they use some stuff that we still use today. So let's get into the video. All right, so I'm going to go through some of the history of the Thomas Hill House. The Thomas Hill House is a historic Greek revival mansion located in Bangor, Maine. It was built in 1836 for Thomas A. Hill, a lawyer and banker who was one of the most prominent citizens of Bangor at the time. The house was designed by Richard Upjohn, one of the most important architects of the Greek revival period. The Thomas Hill House is a two-story brick building with a portico supported by six door columns. The front facade features a Palladian window above the portico. The interior of the house is decorated in the Greek Revival style with high ceilings, marble fireplaces, and elaborate woodwork. According to the Bangor Historical Society, during 1846, Samuel H. Dale combined the two rooms to the right of the front hallway into an elaborate double parlor separated by an archway supported by Corinthian columns. Dale replaced the original Greek Revival stairway about 1860 with a straight-run Italianate stairway. Another Italianate change Dale made from 1855 to 1860 consisted of double front doors with etched glass panels. Originally, there was a single panel door with side lights and transom. These doors have solid silver finials on the hinges. Dormers were added around the turn of the century. 
So it's strange, like the first person I was picking up here was a female that was dressed similar to this, but her hair was slightly different. Um, it was brown, but it had like one curl on each side of her face. The house originally had a cast iron picket fence complete with iron gate atop the granite wall around the house. There was also a gazebo on the property in flower gardens. During the age of the lumber barons, wood became an extremely popular building material. Brick houses such as this one were painted a light color in the hopes of making the bricks take on the appearance of wooden clapboards. The cannon on the lawn is a Civil War Dahlgren 12-pound boat howitzer made in Chicopee, Massachusetts. Its gun carriage mysteriously vanished during the night more than 20 years ago. The two large trees are linden or basswood trees. The Thomas Hill House was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1973. It is now owned by the Bangor Historical Society and is open to the public for tours. So Thomas A. Hill was born in 1783 in Hallowell, Maine. He studied law and was admitted to the bar in 1806. He moved to Bangor in 1811 and quickly became one of the city's leading lawyers. He was also a successful banker and businessman. Hill was a prominent figure in Bangor society. He served as a member of the city council, the state legislator in the United States House of Representatives. He was also a founder of the Bangor Theological Seminary and the Bangor Savings Bank. He died in 1864 at the age of 81. He is buried in the Mount Hope Cemetery in Bangor. This is one of my favorite parts of the guns. You can pause to read this if you need to. I love weapons, if you didn't know. More photos. Oh. The map. This is also one of my favorite parts, is the apothecary's chest. And I don't know if you can read it from here. Again, you're going to have to pause to read it. But look, they've got Epsom salt, whiskey, peppermint, extract of rhubarb, ginger. Look. It's so freaking cool. View. <clears throat> Let's go to the gun room with those swords. Yay! Paul reveres one of his uh, cannons. Basically, as the cannon expels with the the fire and all of that, it would start to burn that shell, so it would burn for five, ten seconds, however however many they would set it for, and then it would explode over the infantry. So basically, just like a shotgun blast or an air burst in, in modern uh, infantry tactics. But yeah, they were, um, they made some pretty deadly advancements over those five years. Everything got more accurate, everything got further distance, and it was a different time. And then, not that long later, we were talking about trench, war trench warfare in World War One, right? And that seemed like a completely different. Yeah, it was, it was nothing, by nothing about maneuvering. I mean, we, when you look at Gettysburg and talking about cavalry and moving of troops, it, World War One was just amassing troops. 
and sitting there for months on end. And it was truly just a war of attrition. There was, I mean, some things that obviously weren't, and there was a lot of the bigger naval engagements, but trench warfare was awful. I mean, all warfare was awful. But when you're sitting there with trench foot and just the illnesses and the scars that was left on the battlefield because of it, I mean, they will, the <laughs> earth around some of those places in France will never look the same as it did in 1911, 1914. If you wanted a heft, I cut down one. This was taken, I think, six to eight inches taken off of it to wow. convert as a uh, hunting rifle after the war. Nice. Uh, not light. Yeah. How heavy is it, AIDS? It's not right. <laughs> I mean, built to last. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yep. So people have to march with this. March, barely wearing shoes. And yeah. You know, you'd have a lot of the northern soldiers wearing a uniform similar to this one. They're pretty much full wool. Pants, jacket, shirt underneath, marching for miles throughout the day and then to have to go and fight. Mm -hmm. In the heat of the south in the summer. Wow. That's yeah, horrible. I mean, it's. I mean, you guys know how how humid it gets in, in Pennsylvania, but yeah. then talk about Georgia, Mississippi. And, mm. I mean, yes. I I have a Civil War reenactor's uniform. I wore it for an event here in August, and it was just so hot. It was just. It gave me a new appreciation for what they were doing, but it was just literally like sweat just rolling down everywhere. Like I had to have somebody help me get the thing off because I just couldn't move. But yeah, and then I mean, a good soldier could do three shots a minute. Oh wow! When, wow. You're, when you're lined up, stuff, yeah. yeah. Wow. When you're lined up, people firing at you, and you're marching just these uh, double file lines. I mean, it was definitely a very very it's so crazy to me. I'd know and be like, hey, what if we wore like shorts and stuff? And then we'd be like, not going to be in. And we could like fight better than the other guys. But you would have had to have more because it does get cooler at night. Mm. So, I mean, that way. I mean, once you got more into World War II, yeah, because they would have like the jungle issue stuff. They had winter weather clothing. A lot of these guys, what they wore in the summer was the same thing that they wore in the winter, and just they would have a blanket or something to. Mm -hmm. Winters were different. They did try to, they didn't do a lot of campaigns in the winter, so they were able to kind of camp and stay warm. But uh, the Australians in World War One did kind of, they were kind of rocking the knickers. Uh, and I mean, then again, you go back to the Scots going way back and wearing the kilts in the battle. I mean, actually the Vikings too. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how that would work for. Actually, our World War One uniforms were a little bit more of like a higher up, not a full knicker, but yeah, I don't think it would work for our country very well, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that would be that'd be different. That'd be a fun picture. The Thomas Hill House has been home to a number of notable people over the years. In addition to Thomas A. Hill, the house has been home to Samuel H. and Matilda Dale. So Matilda Dale's the, the woman I was seeing around the house. Samuel H. Dale was born 1801 in Hallowell, Maine. He was a lawyer and businessman who served as mayor of Bangor from 1863 to 1866, and again from 1871 to 1874. He was also a member of the Maine House of Representatives and the Maine Senate. Matilda Dale was born in 1805 in Bangor, Maine. She was the daughter of a prominent merchant and banker. She was active in civic and social affairs in Bangor. The Dales were married in 1825. They have five children. The Dales lived in the Thomas Hill House from 1846 until their deaths. The Sons of Union Veterans. The Sons of Union Veterans is a fraternal organization for male descendants of Union veterans of the American Civil War. 
The organization was founded in 1881 and is headquartered in Springfield, Massachusetts. The Sons of Union Veterans purchased the Thomas Hill House in 1942 and named it the Grand Army of the Republic Memorial. The house was used as a meeting place and museum for the organization. The Sons of Union Veterans sold the house to Bangor Historical Society in 1974. So that is just like the quick, the quick, the quick history behind it and who lived there. But yeah, so I'm going to wrap up this video. This one is quicker than my usual ones, but there wasn't much going on in terms of the paranormal. Just, you know, seeing Matilda and some faces of you know, some of the other people that had been there or had lived there. But it seemed pretty peaceful overall. And yeah, I definitely recommend visiting there if you are ever in the area. So thank you again for watching this video. I hope maybe, you know, one day if you have the opportunity, you might be like, hey, you know what? This might be a cool place to visit and just, you know, take it in. But yeah, anyway, peace out, guys.